Um, so welcome back, everyone. I hope you enjoyed your tea. Um, I'm delighted to introduce Miroslava Duma now. She's probably most familiar to everyone here as the founder of Bureau, which she founded in 2011 and which was a new digital platform which was sort of organized and designed to penetrate new markets, places that people, luxury, hadn't really been able to get to. But today she comes to us with a completely different venture, which is launching here this afternoon, um, Fashion Tech Lab Ventures, or FTL Ventures. So, Mira, what is FTL Ventures? Thank you very much, Joe, uh, for having us actually today. It's a big and important day. <clears throat> so, the um, FTL Fashion Tech Lab um, is a hybrid between venture capital fund and accelerator that is working with, um, looking for the greatest engineers and scientists that are working with material science, biotech, nanotechnology, smart textiles, wearable tech from all over the world, be it a hidden laboratory in San Francisco that is, for example, growing leather and fur in laboratory environment uh, from stem cells without killing animals, uh, obviously, to um, Shenzhen, where we have part of our team based, um, to Scandinavia, London, where a lot of things happening, Germany, another great um, area in Europe, um, very booming in terms of technologies, um, and ending with uh, Russia, because as you know, Russia is still number one for space industry. And um, the good news is that, led by government contracts and research institutions from military and space industries, many groundbreaking discoveries have been made 10 to 30 years ago already. Um, so it's not new, it's been there, but they've been used under top secret for military purposes, for, you know, to create um, space suits for astronauts to go to space, um, you know, using special fabric that, for example, keep you cool if you decide to go to Venus and there's plus 350 degrees Celsius. Which we do, all Which of we us, do. all the time. <laughs> Well, according to uh, Mr. Elon Musk, um, he's planning to we will be. <laughs> yes, he's planning to co colonize Mars. Uh, Russians are talking about uh, the fact that Venus is much more friendly for for us to be colonized. <laughs> so anyway, yes, those laboratories, those hidden laboratories, are actually working on those really amazing technologies that can, uh, first of all, you know, adjust your body temperature. And if you feel cold, it warms, it, it, um, warms you up. If, it, if you feel uh, hot, it cools you down, and so on and so forth. There is a lot of amazing things happening in that world. Okay, so what we're talking about is you going to these laboratories, meeting these kind of tech developers, scientists across the world. I think you've, you've been talking to about a thousand or there's a thousand companies in the pipeline yes. you've selected so far around 50 of those people who meet the criteria that you want to work with but then your role now is in facilitating their access to what you said to me the other day the 2.4 trillion dollar industry world of fashion yes so tell me how does a girl from siberia end up going around the world looking at sort of fur being grown in a petri dish from a stem cell and and how did you get from the front row which is where i've been used to seeing you for the last two years to becoming this kind of tech revolutionary thank you very much we feel we're at the very beginning even though we have big dream uh you know as as one big historical hero used to say dream impossible you will reach maximum that's what we're <laughs> dreaming about impossible um, just, you know, to give a couple of examples of the companies and the technologies that we have already invested in that we are working with. So there is a super secretive laboratory in San Francisco that is growing leather and fur, which is basically like a, the highest level of um, leather you can imagine. There's another uh, laboratory that we've invested in that joined our portfolio called um, Diamond Foundry. Diamond Foundry. They grow yep. diamonds in laboratory environment, uh, uh, environment, avoiding kid slavery issues, environmental issues, and so on and so forth. How they do it, they take a tiny layer of um, mined diamond, they bring it in the laboratory, and under carbon heat, they grow technically 
identical diamonds. And no one in the world can tell the difference between mine diamond and laboratory grown diamond. <clears throat> There's only one machine in the world that after a couple of hours of investigation can tell you mined diamond, laboratory grown diamond. And obviously when we came across with that technology, we, you know, we needed an advice. And so we were lucky enough to have a good friend of ours who used to be back then a CEO of Alrosa. Alrosa is the second largest um, diamond producer in the world, a Russian company, actually number one uh, for industrial diamonds. So he, we came to him and asked him, what do you think? Yeah. Is it worth looking into investing you know, in them, talk about them, bringing them to the industry? And he actually said that, um, according to different reports, the um, earth um, the capacities of Earth diamonds on a planet will disappear in a, by, around, in, in a, by around 2030. So basically, companies like De Beers and Alrosa potentially are looking at the technology like Diamond Foundry uh, to invest in, you know, because that's an alternative for them in 13 to 15 year perspective. And so they're quite big. They raised around 100 million dollars already. And um, one of their, one of our, the co-investors, Leonardo DiCaprio, who is a great environmentalist, and he pushes them in uh, Hollywood. They have really great uh, support in um, San Francisco. And they just moved to uh, a new laboratory, which is five times bigger than the one they um, they started with. And um, yeah, so our goal is to bring them actually to the, to the industry, to the extremely closed $2.4 trillion fashion industry to form collaborations and to try to make big brands embrace those new alternative renewable resources and energy. So There's another company called Orange Fiber, and we just recently announced about their collaboration with um, Ferragamo. Ferragamo. So, to just very briefly, it's an Italian scientist that after she discovered that there's around one million tons of orange peels end up in landfills every year in Italy only, she started to think what can be done with this so-called garbage. So after two years of investigating and experimenting, she came up with the technology of producing um, textile made of 100% recycled orange peels, which is 100% breathable, organic, sustainable um, uh, material. and. Um, she contacted the largest uh, juice producing companies in Italy, so she gets that garbage for free yep. because, you know, otherwise they pay, you know, they rent uh, landfills and they have to pay money. So it's a win-win situation. It's a circular, you know, yep. economy that everybody's talking about today. So um, it's quite an exciting, you know, thing. And then when we actually, uh, when I touched the fabric, the prototype for the first time, I thought that I actually, had, you know, I. I it, it's a silk in my uh, like the touch and feel is it's it's a it's a silk. I mean my, I mean you have raised 50 million I think already in five months for FTL Ventures, and um, you then broker these relationships with the luxury houses, and then you're collaborating both with them and independently. So it's a three kind of pillar yep. organization. But my. Query is, how does the luxury industry respond to this? Because typically you think of luxury, you think of art, the art of the hand, this craftsmanship, these incredible old tanneries that have been around for centuries. Are they really receptive to it, or are they slightly horrified by the idea of silk made out of orange peel? So, you know, um, I always say that um, we live in a very interesting uh, times. Uh, actually, at the forefront of fourth industrial revolution, when everything is changing. And if you think of you know, how we used to live and, um, and breathe, let's say even five years ago, it was quite you know, a different life that we were, that we were living. Like if, if you think of uh, uh, the fact that we touch our phones up to 1,500 times a week, that's quite... Um, touch them. Touch them. Me, more like 7,000, 10,000 <laughs> times a week. I mean, that's like, I thought you were going to tell me per hour. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, right? So that's like a real addiction. And then if you think, if you think of a like couple of examples, um, let's take Kodak. I love to give that example. Um, in, in 1998, Kodak employed 170,000 uh, people. And... Um, uh, basically, 
uh, were responsible for 85% of photo paper worldwide. Yeah. In just a couple of years, their business model disappeared and they went bankrupt because obviously people started to shoot you know, on phones and, and, yeah. and so on and so forth. Um, My question to you there, though, is what I'm, yeah, photo, what I'm, photo paper is not a luxury product necessarily. So that's more of a... It's a more of a, pr a practical object. How do you translate that into a kind of silk scarf or something that is a more luxurious kind of... The thing is that the process of running the industry on 100% renewable and alternative energy and resources is inevitable. Yeah. It will happen no matter what. It's just the way we go. It's just the way the world goes, especially our industry. Because bad news is that, you know, I was born in Siberia, and I was growing up with an idea that it's not just the coldest area of Russia, but also the wealthiest for oil, gas, and natural resources capacity. So I was growing up with an idea that there is nothing worse for planet than, than oil industry. And when I actually discovered that fashion and apparel industry goes right after oil, and I was so you know inspired by the, the beautiful and creative um, industry, it was quite a shock for me, to be very honest, and uh, I thought, if I can change something, if I can contribute, I'd love to stay here. If no, I don't really want to add to, to the global you know, problem of, of garbage because there's like, you know, just, just to give you a couple of examples. In 2014, around 100 billion items of clothing have been produced. Yeah. Half of which, um, around 80 billion items of clothing have been purchased, half of which ended up in landfills. Already. Already. Around 10 million tons of clothing uh, go to landfills every year in US only. And uh, you know the process of water dyeing our textiles disposes the, uh, the equivalent to half of Mediterranean Sea into our rivers and streams. So the global problem yeah. of uh, polluting and garbage is really, is really global and is really, uh, I would say, scary. Okay. The next so, thing, though, that I wonder about that is if you're going in on that revolutionary, change the world, we can make it better, why start with a luxury house, which was going to count for like a tiny, tiny percentage of the market? Well, like, why, why not go to, like, I say, H&M or Uniqlo or... We were just with them in Stockholm. Okay. We made that trip yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for one day. It was uh, May 9th, and it was a snowstorm. It was very, very cold. But um, I have to tell you, good news is that that particular brand is very much ready for that, and uh, they're very open. More than that, <clears throat> they announced about the initiative called Global Change Award that we are about to partner with, because they are um, basically the first year when they announced, they received two... 1,800 applications of different technologies. And the orange fiber, by the way, that we invested, ended up investing in uh, is one of the finalists from, uh, from last year. So, you know, when we started to dive into this world, we realized that it's not new. It's been there again yeah. for, for, for decades. And uh, we believe that it's exactly the right time now to try to get those innovations out of laboratories and bring them to the market. Because the two new generations who are millennials and we're still there, and Gen Z, who are our kids, yeah. um, you know, those are the ones who very much, like, you know, if you, look, if you think of like a, like a classical form of marketing, um, they think about we think about um, design and, and, and um, you know, the brand image. Nowadays, the new generations, they actually look at whether you are both socially and responsible uh, and um, uh, environmentally responsible. Secondly, they are looking at whether the clothes that you are producing is, uh, are solving their problems. Okay, let's, in let's, any way. let's focus on this problem solving because you're going to expect people to spend a huge amount of money on some of these items. They're not cheap, presumably. Um, what do you mean by problem solving? As an example, there is a technology that we found in Germany. They embed silver yarn in any fiber, uh, which has very strong antibacterial and anti-radiation property, as well as zero bad smell. Right. So um, you can basically use it with silk, with uh, wool, with cotton, anything. And uh, the person that introduced me to that technology, he was um, on, 
like a sourcing tour in, it, in um, uh, Europe, and he said that it was 15 days. He was wearing the same T-shirt every day, and he was no, not bringing it to. For us, it's like impossible to even imagine that, right? Because did you get right in there and sniff. So, <laughs> uh, so what he said actually, he did that obviously. So he said, you know, I was visiting different uh, factories, and I was in airports, you know, with meeting people and cars and so on and so forth. And so he said, every every single evening, he, he came back to hotel. He took off the uh, uh, t-shirt, tried to smell anything, zero. So 15th day, he you know went to celebrate you know the, uh, the the trip with his team, and they went to like a bar where there was a lot of people sweating and smoking. So he said, "I'm done. My experiment is over." So next morning, he wakes up, zero smell, and so. I had this conversation <laughs> with a Stanford alumni who is the daughter of basically she's he's a legend of venture capital world in um, in Silicon Valley. So she told me, you know, I buy silk short worth $300. I wear it once and I bring it to the laundry right after. Yep. And eventually I spend more money on laundry than on actual garment. And I don't like it. It's not comfortable. She's a millennial. She is the one who has extra money, extra $300 yeah. to, to pay for laundry. But she's thinking about the time. She's thinking about money. She's thinking about also water and chemicals yeah. that, you know, is in, inside this uh, process. There's another great technology. It's um, chemicals, basically, that can Im be embedded in any kind of, again, fiber that, has, that is um, oh, um, any liquid repelling. Right. So let's say, I don't know, you're wearing a beautiful white dress, um, and you're with your daughter in a restaurant. She pours the red, red wine. wine on you. And it just basically go down, goes down and uh, there's nothing. Same with furniture, same with carpet, because textile is uh, everywhere, right? Even the, co the, you know, the cotton pads that we clean our face with, uh, clothes, furniture, cars, airplanes. Again, it's absolutely everywhere. There's another amazing techno I'm technology. I'm going to stop you for two seconds, yeah. though, because I want to just... So the point being that the person who will buy this has to be convinced that the piece is luxurious as a kind of tactile, visible, it has to look as good as possible, has to be designed as well as possible, um, and it's going to solve some functional thing that will make their life better, but maybe incidental. It's, but it's got to satisfy all those criterion. Yes, exactly. So um, it's all about, we come from the perspective of problem solving, you know, because yeah. we also, as you can imagine, you know, in this, inside this process of sourcing around the world, uh, we come across with uh, lots of sometimes crazy technologies. Sometimes, you know, I always say vision without execution is hallucination, you know, and basically that's very often what we see, what we come across with, uh, with, you know, super early stage technologies, you know, when as an example, there is a, a technology that is growing uh, fabric out of algae. Yeah. You know, it's it, what's growing under underwater. It's super, super early. That's actually what might take like another 10 to 20 years to be able to scale up. But again, there is lots of amazing companies and technologies that are solving customers' problems. Same as the antimicrobial. Um, property, same with, for example, world of wearable tech, yeah. where those amazing engineers are producing the microscopic computers and monitors that they embed in fibers that collect data on your body. So, for example, imagine the person who, who is suffering from diabetes. Um, there's a company that we recently came across with. They produce uh, socks with microscopic monitors embedded in socks. So, because the... Um, People who suffer from diabetes, they have problems with veins. And the first to react when sugar goes up in the blood, veins in the feet. Yep. So the person gets message on iPhone, on, 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 on his phone, when sugar goes up in the blood because those microscopic monitors inside their socks monitor that. So imagine the amount of problems in terms of you know um, yeah. health that people can uh, can avoid you know be it older people or pregnant women or maybe people you know under uh, medical treatment and so on and so forth. There is another really great. I want to ask yes. you though, because <laughs> Mira never stops <laughs> once she goes. She rattles through all the co all the companies. I mean your checklist. I'm just asking one of the questions that's popped up here. Um, you say you look at a various sort of um, ecological sustainability. Where is it? Where, what is the specific criterion? I mean, is it how rigorous is it? 
are you, what, how are you kind of, you know, meeting the criterion? Yeah, good question. So speaking, going back to the silver yarns. So we met with um, another great company that actually told us, you know what, silver comes from mining, so it's not 100% sustainable. Like, the process can't unfortunately be 100% uh, sustainable, but still, there are fabrics, there are different ways that can um, maximize the, um, it's, you know, another commitment that basically H&M just did recently, you know, to become climate positive by 2040, I think. Um, so what they do, what these people from um, Scandinavia do, they embed uh, peppermint yeah. in, in, in fiber, which has as strong uh, antimicrobial power uh, property as um, silver and zinc. Uh, but it's, as you can imagine, 100% um, sustainable. So in terms of getting these things to market, you're looking at um, Diamond Foundry could legitimately be producing diamonds, is producing diamonds for the luxury industry anytime soon? Or? Yes, they're actually, we are actually already in conversation and negotiations with different big international jewelry brands. And also that's, that's the conversations that we have with different uh, you know, young people that say, I don't want to buy, I don't want to buy um, an engagement ring for my uh, girlfriend because there might have been blood on those diamonds, right. but I want them to be technically earth diamonds, but grown in 100% uh, environmentally friendly um, environment. And uh, same with, um, for example, there is um, a scientist from Israel that came up with the technology of producing plastic, um, 100% compostable plastic bags, which is, as you can imagine, is a huge problem because if you think of the problem of the sea and oceans, soon th there actually can be more plastic bottles and, and, box and, and, um, and bags than fishes. But then when those plastic you know, bottles uh, go, into, go into sea, yep. obviously that's what you know, fish and, and, and um, sure. uh, you know, eat and, and, th and then that's You're what we eat. Polluting the whole ecosystem. Exactly. So that's again a major problem that um, that is there and... Uh, but we've all know, we know all a lot of these things and I know you're providing solutions but I'm still curious as to how the business of luxury responds response. to it because you know plasticky fish is not sexy for a lot of brands I think. I mean they all care but it's like someone else's problem or it's not something that they perhaps want to make. But do you think sustainability is genuinely becoming far greater part of a legitimate aim yeah. for, these, for these companies? So there's two different types of reaction from, yeah. from our partners and friends from the industry. First, the ones who genuinely believe in it, who genuinely uh, want to co-invest together with us and are super open to that and even now come to us with some interesting ideas and maybe some engineers that pitched them and others that um, understand that there is a huge trend, you know, of, you know, being envi environmentally friendly, um, you know, sustainable, sustainability conscious and so on and so forth. And they come from the perspective of marketing and PR. So they think it could be a good, you know, marketing right. project. We want to do that as well. We honestly don't really care. Yeah. You know, from which perspective it comes, as long as, as the big brand embraces it, and why we actually start with big brands, because those are the ones who are setting trends, yeah. right? And then we believe that everyone else in the world uh, will follow. And also, but also very they've got the money to invest. Exactly. Like they can't, you can't do that unless you're going to the big corporate groups who've got the ability to work with you. Exactly. We also try to work with different schools like St. Martin's, Parsons, yeah. like CFDA, Council of Fashion Designers of America, British Fashion Council, the Australian Fashion Chamber, anyone you can imagine, Woolmark, basically, again, anyone, because those are the ones Woolmark, who are... Woolmark, by the way. Huh? Wool Woolmark, Woolmark, not Woolmart, just to be Woolmark. clear. Yes, yeah. yes, 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 <laughs> yeah. exactly. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm speaking in no, English. No, it's fine, <laughs> by just checking. English. It's like, hang on a minute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What and kind so of luxury is that? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> no. <laughs> and so, uh, yes, you know, you, we try to come, you know, again, from that perspective, from, from the new generation also of create young, uh, creative, um, um, you know, young, um, 
uh, designers. designers, yes, yeah. Yeah, um, design ta talents um, that you know are now actually looking, you know, for the alternatives for the uh, you know production facilities and so on and so forth. So um, yeah, it's to be very honest, we're very enthusiastic because uh, the reaction so far has been very uh, warm. Yeah. Um, all the brands, all our partners and friends um, have been very receptive and have been very supportive. They believe in it as we feel. Um. And what do you see? You know, you talk about it as being a fourth revolution, manufacturing revolution. What will happen? Will, uh, will it, do you envisage a new world order in which lots of companies will just die away? Or do you see kind of how do you how do you see the sort of landscape of luxury in say 20 years? Uh, I think you know what actually Klaus Schwab who is a founder of um, uh, Davos says that the world witnessed uh, three industrial revolutions before and the gap between first and second and third was much longer than the one between third and fourth and no one could really predict the fourth to come so soon and so quickly you know with all those 3d printing artificial intelligence uh, alternative energy resources um, um, quantum computing uh, and, and much more um, that is again changing our lives completely if you think actually globally about the on-demand economy that's happening now uh, you know with um, with platforms like let's say the biggest taxi company in the world yep. uber owns no vehicles yeah or the biggest accommodation company in the world which is airbnb owns no real estate or you can for example get an access to billions of books via amazon uh, kindle or for example you can read a, you can listen to any music, Without any song, record. via Spotify. Yeah. And so again, I had this conversation with um, Ian Rogers, from, um, who is now Chief, Technical, uh, Chief Digital Officer of LVMH. And he said when he worked at Apple and when they were launching Apple Music, people you know, said, you guys are crazy. It's not going to work. People were listening to music on CDs, are listening to music on CDs, and will listen to music on CDs. And we no. all... You know, no the, the, CD in, the CD producing industry was basically, again, killed by... But by they do listen to music on vinyl. So there are other kind of older technologies which could be nurtured and they're sort of more kind of, I suppose, artisanal people that could kind of emerge out of this in a slightly different light as well. Yeah. But you know what also we do, what's, uh, what's interesting and important? So there's three main pillars of FTL. One, which is an investment vehicle. Uh, two when we bring the technology and the engineer that but we the found the to, the, to, the to the industry, try to form collaborations. And the great example is uh, Orange Fiber and Ferragamo, their uh, capsule collection. And the third is experimental lab, inside which we are actually experimenting on our own products, uh, which are, we call them, the perfect products of future that are both technologically advanced, innovative, and are solving customers' problems, but at the same time have beautiful, minimalistic, and modern design. Because if you think of the tech world, uh, the technology is there, but the design, I'm very sorry, is ugly. You yeah. know, if you go to Kickstarter, for example, and you see products, you know, that are being presented there, you Horrible. don't really want to, you know, you don't yeah. really want to buy that. And even though... I think that um, you know, fashion garments, uh, clothes nowadays don't really solve lots of our problems. They warm us up. They maybe solve some vanity slash status issues if you know it's something very um, expensive. You know, so that we wear it and we know that people you know see and and we feel like we can afford it. And maybe again, it solves some of our problems. There is zero problem solving in the end. Right. Um, and so that's what we are trying to do also inside the experimental lab and there's more news coming very soon. Very good. Mira, that was amazing. I hope everyone caught up and could follow it all because she rattles through. Um, but I think it was um, tremendously interesting and so exciting. Thanks so much for joining Thank us. Thank you so much for having us.